See the magnetic fields twisting around the Milky Way's supermassive black hole. A supernova seen in almost real time. NASA announces its planetary science goals for Artemis 3 and Gaia finds two ancient building blocks of the Milky Way. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. The Event Horizon Telescope, a worldwide network of radio telescopes acting as one single giant radio telescope the size of planet Earth. This incredible instrument is what has brought us the first images of the event horizon of supermassive black holes. We've seen two, the supermassive black hole at the heart of M87 and the black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. And these are the only two that the Event Horizon Telescope can actually image. And that's because they're visually the two largest black holes that we can see on the sky. But they are incredibly small and only a world sized telescope can reveal them. But the Event Horizon Telescope showed us those first images of these black hole event horizons and then came back around for a second round, showing us the polarization of the light around the supermassive black hole at the heart of M87. And that relates to the magnetic field lines as they twist around this supermassive black hole. Well, now the Event Horizon Telescope team has done the even more difficult job of showing the magnetic field lines around the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. What's happening is they're measuring the polarization of the light that is coming from this region. You've got all of these particles that are caught up in these magnetic field lines and they're tumbling around in the field lines and they're causing various polarization of light to come our way. And though by mapping out the polarization, you then essentially understand the magnetic field lines in the region. This is done all the time in astronomy. But to see the polarization from Sag A star, our supermassive black hole, is really tricky. It is much smaller, more dynamic, more fast moving than the one at the heart of M87. And so it requires a lot more observing time and a lot more calculation to really understand what it is that you're looking at. What's really amazing is that you can see the swirling magnetic field lines both for M87 and now with Sag A star. And these are dramatically different mass black holes. And yet it clearly scales up. You have the smaller version for the Milky Ways. You have a larger version at M87. You probably have a similar version for a stellar mass black hole. This it's just the mass that scales up. And yet the underlying dynamics appear to be the same from black hole to black hole. A supernova caught in almost real time. The problem with supernova is that you never know where they're going to explode. It's a gigantic sky. And one of these could appear in any galaxy across the universe. And there's too many to count. And so astronomers have to look at them after the fact. But astronomers got extremely lucky recently when they were queuing up the Hubble Space Telescope to examine a supernova that was interacting with its environment. And suddenly, another supernova went off extremely close. And when I say extremely close, I mean that astronomically speaking, it went off in the spiral galaxy M101, which is also known as the pinwheel galaxy. It's famous, you recognize this galaxy. And it is only 21 million light years away from us. And I say only but that's like astronomically speaking, that's actually relatively close considering we can see supernova when they are billions of light years away. And so they had Hubble, they knew the filters are going to use the calibration, they knew what they were going to do, but they were able to turn Hubble and then watch this supernova unfolding instead of the target they were originally planning. And so they were able to catch it so quickly that they could see as the supernova was still making its way out of the surrounding gas and dust that had been thrown out by the star in previous years. So really as close as you could get. And then other space and ground based telescopes jumped on and were able to image it in different wavelengths, infrared, x ray, and so on. What gets even better was that because this galaxy is so well known, so well studied, and the region had been analyzed by the Hubble Space Telescope relative recently. And so they were actually able to pinpoint the specific star that had exploded the red supergiant before it exploded. And so when you sort of put it all together, you see the star in context in the galaxy. And then you see the unfolding moments of the supernova, like the next best thing would be able to actually see the star go supernova. But this is as close as astronomers have gotten. NASA announces the science goals for Artemis three. 
I'm sure you're aware NASA is planning to return humans to the moon by 2026. And you know, who knows that timeline might slip again. But even so, humans are going back to the moon. And they're going to a region that is about six degrees latitude away from the moon south pole. We don't know the exact landing point yet. But there's been a bunch of potential sites that have been shortlisted. Now it's just a matter of deciding on what is the final best place to land the astronauts. And so this month, we got an announcement from NASA at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference of what their science geology goals are for the Artemis three mission. Specifically, they talked about the three experiments that they're going to be setting up. So the first is called the Lunar Environment Monitoring Station or LEMS. And this is a seismometer that they're going to put onto the surface of the moon that's going to allow them to track moonquakes and other seismic activity that's going to happen near the moon south pole. The second experiment is called the Lunar Dielectric Analyzer or LDA. And this is going to help them understand the volatiles in the lunar regolith. Like the big goal of going to the moon south pole is to find out is there a way to use the volatile elements, the water ice, other gases that are trapped in the regolith and trapped in these permanently shadowed craters at the moon south pole. Is there a way to use it as rocket fuel a way for astronauts to be able to breathe have water. So understanding these volatiles is incredibly important for NASA. And then the third experiment is called the lunar effects on agricultural flora or leaf. And this is a backronym if I've ever heard one. And with this, they're going to be finding out whether lunar regolith can be used as a medium for growing plants. And this experiment has been done on Earth both with simulated lunar regolith and also real tiny amounts of lunar regolith. But now they're going to have access to the mother load as much lunar regolith as they can scoop into some potting soil. And we're going to find out whether or not plants can sprout in this lunar regolith. So we've got three experiments. There's a whole bunch of science goals that go along with this. And we've got a lot more reporting on this over at Universe Today. Gaia finds ancient streams of stars. The Milky Way was built up over billions of years through the mergers of multiple dwarf galaxies, and then larger galaxies all coming together. And today we see this giant spiral galaxy that's spinning around, but it is actually made up of all the threads of all of the torn up sub galaxies that joined us over the Milky Way's ancient 13.8 billion years of existence. And now astronomers have used my favorite telescope Gaia to find two of probably the oldest galaxies that formed part of the Milky Way. They found these two streams of stars that contain about 10 million stars each. And the stars themselves are in the 12 to 13 billion years old range. So you can actually see these two threads of stars whirled up in the galaxy that we know were those two early building blocks. They've nicknamed them Shakti and Shiva. And these two trails of stars they move through the galaxy are on totally different paths, separate and independent from each other. And it's believed that they were born really before the disk of the Milky Way had fully formed. Veritas is back in business. NASA has put a priority on returning to Venus. We haven't had a proper space mission at Venus that was able to map the surface of the planet since 1990. Do you remember the Magellan spacecraft? No, you don't. You weren't even born yet. Well, that's when it happened. And now NASA is planning on sending two spacecraft back to Venus. One is called Da Vinci and the other is called Veritas. But last year we got the bad news that NASA had received a lot less funding than they were expecting. So they had to put a bunch of their missions on hold or downgrade them. And one of those was the Veritas mission. They gave it like $1.5 million for the entire year just to keep it operational, but not actually fully develop it. Well, we just learned that they've gotten full approval to move forward with the Veritas mission. Instead of the original launch date of 2028, that's been pushed back to 2031. So it's going to take a few more years before it actually goes to space, but it is going to space. And when it does go to Venus, it's going to have this incredibly sensitive instrument that's going to allow it to measure the surface of Venus, provide high resolution images of the surface of Venus. And there's a lot of really interesting mysteries that are starting to unfold on Venus. We reported that they think there might be 
active volcanism still going on on Venus. And so if you could actually track the surface features, see changes over time, maybe you can track some of these volcanoes in action. There have been some landslides potentially found on Venus. So again, higher resolution would be really helpful to find out if this is the case. So Veritas is back on and it could be that we're going to get some updated maps of the surface of Venus. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story. And last week you voted for Trains on the Moon. Uh, and I can't blame you. That's awesome. Trains on the Moon. Someone posted in the comments that they'd like to see a hyperloop on the moon, but because it's the vacuum of the moon, all trains are hyperloops on the moon, aren't they? Now we'll post the vote for this week's episode of Space Bites within about 24 hours here on the community tab on the YouTube channel. Now you can go to the community tab, see the vote, or just as you're scrolling YouTube, the vote should show up. So just take a second, vote. Uh, of course, the best chance to see it is if you're subscribed and you've clicked the notification bell. So do that now. China's new relay satellite is in orbit. China has been putting a lot of its lunar exploration efforts into the far side of the moon. We saw the Chang'e 4 mission go to the far side of the moon with a lander and a rover that's still operational. And now the next three missions planned for the moon are also going to go to the far side. So Chang'e 6, Chang'e 7, Chang'e 8, Chang'e 6 is going to retrieve a sample from the far side of the moon. Uh, I think Chang'e 7 is going to do something similar. Chang'e 8 is going to test in situ resource utilization at the south pole of the moon, see if they can 3D print stuff out of lunar regolith. So they've got a lot of plans for the far side of the moon, but the far side of the moon is out of radio contact with Earth. And so China has sent its second relay satellite to be able to relay communications from the surface of the moon back to Earth. The spacecraft is called Chu Chao 2 and the first one was called Chu Chao 1. And so the spacecraft follows a really elliptical orbit. For most of its time, it's able to see the landing sites on the moon as well as the Earth. And so the spacecraft on the surface of the moon will communicate with the relay satellite. It'll communicate back to Earth and it will be able to allow constant operations and communications with these spacecraft. And eventually NASA is going to have to do the same thing. If they want to be able to operate at the far side of the moon, they're going to need a way to relay their communications. Hubble sees a new star. Stars like our sun formed in a giant stellar nebula. It had this vast cloud of gas and dust and then some event like a nearby supernova shock wave began this collapsing process where all of the gas came down together as it compressed down tighter and tighter then you got this protostar start to heat up at the center of the nebula. And then eventually the star ignited the fusion in its core and blasted away all of the final material around it. And now astronomers have found a star that's in the very earliest stages of this process. In fact, they found two stars, a binary pair that are at varying stages of stellar evolution. These images come from the Hubble Space Telescope. They show the binary system FS Tau. And there are two stars in this system. The one at the center, the very bright one, this is FS Tau A, and it is a protostar, a T Tauri star, which is only 2.8 million years old. But more interestingly, in the upper right, you can see this fainter object, and that is FS Tau B, which is a protostar. It is much younger than that main star down in the middle. And it is just going through this process of gravitational heating. So it hasn't been able to generate fusion in its core. Instead, it is heating up just because all of this gas is compressing down and you're getting this heating that's beginning. And over time, it will eventually ignite the core in the star. And it's already starting to spin up and produce these jets. You can see this blue feature in the picture. Those, these are the jets of material that are already starting to come out from this protostar. If you want to understand more about protostars, the FS Tau B, that is classified as a herbig harrow object, and it'll be in this state for a few more million years, and then it'll shift over to this next class of object, which is called a T Tauri star, which is like FS Tau. And then after about 100 million years, both of those stars will have compressed enough at their cores, their fusion will have ignited and they'll turn into full main sequence stars like the sun. See a real time map of starlings. There are 5601 starlings in orbit right now. And like that's a lot, right? Like, but space is big. 
right? If you want to wrap your mind around this and understand sort of visually what does it look like to have that many satellites around Earth, a programmer named Will Depew has pulled on some external sources of data for the positions of all of the Starlink satellites and then mapped them in real time around the Earth. And so you can actually see the exact positions, not to scale exactly, of all of these satellites. And you can shift the time forward and back, you can go at different speeds, you can see as the Earth rotates, and as the Starlinks are moving around the Earth. And that is a lot. And just keep in mind that this is just a fraction. SpaceX is hoping to have 10,000 Starlinks, 30,000 Starlinks, not to mention constellations from the Chinese, from Amazon and other mega constellations. So this is like as uncongested as low Earth orbit is going to get. We covered a lot of stories here on Space Bites, but this is just a fraction of the stories that we're working on on Universe Today. I am writing my weekly email newsletter right now, and it has 30 to 40 stories that we're covering over at Universe Today, as well as links to tons of other sites on stories that we're not even covering. Just to give you a couple of examples, the European Space Agency just released a report saying that Enceladus is the plan. James Webb sees a planet just wrapping up its formation. And finally, an explanation for blue supergiants. Do they come from merging stars? Again, I send out this newsletter every Friday. It is gigantic. I write every word. It's completely free. So you can sign up, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. I'm going to talk about Venus for a bit. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Antonio Lofilari, David Giltonen, and Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Ansis, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fyler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So this story about Veritas that we covered this week, this actually came from an interview that Lawrence Tugnetti, one of the writers at Universe Today, did with Dr. Paul Byrne, who is a Venus advocate and one of my favorite people. I've done an interview with Paul Byrne. He was a co-host on the Weekly Space Hangout for several episodes, and he's really interesting and fun to talk to. And I've always been a bit of a grump about Venus, you know, because it's such a hellscape. It's one of the less interesting places to me compared to, say, Europa, Enceladus, even Mars. And Paul brought me around. We chatted a lot about sort of what Venus has to offer as an analog of Earth, a place that is almost exactly the same as Earth. And yet, for some reason, it went horribly, horribly wrong, while Earth is, you know, downright livable. And so if you want to see more information on that and sort of see a much longer interview with me and Paul, and you'll get a sense of why he's such a character and so interesting and a great advocate for Venus, definitely check out this interview that I did with Dr. Paul Byrne. All right, we'll see you next week.